In early 1862, while the armies back east were still in their development phase, armies were moving in the west. While Missouri had never officially seceded from the Union, there was no doubt a large secessionist and pro-slavery movement in the area. While the Union spent much of late 1861 pushing Confederate troops to the south and west through Missouri, the retreating Confederate troops fell back into Arkansas. To see our full history review of Pea Ridge, be sure to check out our video with the link in the corner. Today on Tabletop History, we will regain the Battle of Pea Ridge from 7th and 8th March of 1862. Our Union side today will be led by Samuel Curtis and Franz Siegel. The political divide between the two seemed to hamper a little bit on the battlefield, but not too much. Today, we see them under two different commands. The Confederates are led by Earl Van Dorn, who commands the Army of the West, but also has a large contingent of untested volunteer Missouri State Guard soldiers with him as well. They are not very strong despite their larger numbers. This gives the Union somewhat of an advantage as they will be able to be much stronger on the field. Our initial deployment sees Van Dorn positioning his army coming down the Telegraph Road from the northeast to the southwest. The Union soldiers are positioned along this line as well, the one exception being Carr's division who is stationed far to the northeast near the Elkhorn Tavern. Turn one begins with the Confederates having movement initiative. The Missouri State Guard moves first towards Elkhorn Tavern with the idea of trying to push back the Union positions there. The initial movement seems successful and Price also moves up his division to challenge the Union lines. Far to the rear, Siegel takes his command to the northwest, knowing that McCullough's division, although not yet on the battlefield, will show up for the Confederates after turn three. The early positioning here towards Leetown will hopefully position them better for the oncoming battle. Meanwhile, Curtis moves the rest of his command to the north and east to support Carr's division, who is being overwhelmed at this point. Turn one saw a lot of offensive positioning. Siegel moving to the northwest for the Union, but Carr coming under heavy attack from the Missouri State Guard, with Price's division attacking the far right edge of Carr's division. Jones's artillery is definitely under attack here, however they are able to hold off the Confederate advance. Vandever does take one point of casualty, but is not yet broken. Turn 2 sees the Union trying to bottleneck the oncoming Confederate advance to the northeast. In doing so, they can hopefully maintain control of the field. Turn 2 again sees the Confederates with a movement advance. However, Jones's artillery is able to hold back Price's division. The Missouri State Guard Division moves further up on Carr's Union defenses as well. The battle rages near the Elkhorn Tavern. However, Dodge, with some incredible dice rolling, is able to push back several Confederate brigades, doing serious damage and finding himself eventually far behind Confederate lines. But in doing so, even though he is out of position, his strength allows him to push around the much weaker Confederate brigades. This important movement early in the battle spells disaster for the Confederacy. Even though that they have the turn initiative at this point, brigades are being broken despite their huge numerical advantages. Vandever is not quite as successful, however, and is pushed back behind the Elkhorn Tavern. Hoping for the rest of Curtis's command to come up with reinforcements soon, the attempt here is to hold position.
Dodge is able to take out Van Dorn in this turn as well. It's incredible what Dodge has been able to do with this position, and it just shows the ability that the Union Brigades have in this battle. The very weary Confederacy is not able to hold up to the Union attacks despite their larger numbers. Dodge's push through the Confederate lines has broken not one, but two different units, including General Van Dorn. Although he finds himself deep behind Confederate lines at this point, he's definitely a thorn in the side of the Confederacy that makes them change their tactics early on in this battle. Another important point is that with Dodge's taking out of General Van Dorn, the Confederates find that they do not have the same advantage that they normally would have regularly. The death of a Confederate general means half of the priority points in this rule set, which is Altar of Freedom by Greg Wagner. So losing the general not only means that one unit is lost for the Confederacy, it also means that they do not have the same advantage. Van Dorn is replaced by a different general. We don't have a name for them as this is just a game simulation. But while the Confederates look across the field, they are in disrepair despite their large numbers. McCole's division has not yet arrived from the west. The Union forces are starting to move up. With their line secured, the Union side takes the initiative this turn. Trying to push back Price's division along the eastern side of the battle and the Missouri State Guard around Elkhorn Tavern. The Union sees mixed dice rolling at this point as the Confederates are able to hold back their initial attack. Despite being outflanked, the disaster is not as bad as it could have been with turn 3. The Confederates are able to hold their position. In the meantime, Siegel continues to prepare for McCullough's eventual arrival which is due to happen at the end of this turn. Dodge's brigade continues to be a thorn in the side of the Confederate attack. Driving back unit after unit, Dodge is able to push back Confederate lines. Price, being one of the stronger divisions on the field, does much better against the Union attack. However, they are still under threat, especially with Dodge's brigade far to their rear. The Missouri State Guard Division tries to take care of this, threatening Dodge and forcing him to back up. However, Dodge's position allows him to possibly flank the weakened brigades under Price's command. Union and Confederate lines reorganized themselves at the end of turn three, which saw a bit of an organizational turn at this point. There's definitely some threats going on from the reinforcements that the Union brought up from the south. Davis's division there to assist Carr. Davis does attack Price and the side of the Missouri State Guard. However, strong Confederate dice rolling prevented this from becoming a disaster. Dodge's brigade is still far behind Confederate lines, but is able to do some damage. The turn here sees Dodge try to counter-attack Price and put himself into position to double envelop Price's division. The remainder of Carr and Davis's line under Curtis reform in between the Elkhorn Tavern and the Pratt store. Meanwhile, on the west, Siegel further prepares for McCullough's reinforcements, which show up here at the beginning of turn four. Carr and Davis continue to pound on Price's line, trying to push them further and further back and weaken them. At this point in the battle, the Union has lost zero brigades to the Confederates too meaning they are already at their halfway point for victory conditions, which in this battle are simply to eliminate the opposing army. Siegel forms his line along the Ford Road to the northwest of Leestown. 
Pensacola does the same, sending his artillery far to the south. While the Missouri State Guard continues pursuit of Dodge's brigade to their rear, Price's division sees an opportunity to possibly push back against some of the Union forces that have been a threat to them. Strategic Union artillery pushes back the main assault and prevents it from being nearly as bad as it could have been, however. McCullough and Siegel prepare to face each other to the northwest of Leetown. Turn 4 sets the stage for what is sure to be an interesting battle to come up on both the western and eastern flanks of this battle. Davis has been unable to take out Price, however Dodge's brigade in the rear of the Confederate lines is sure to be a factor. McCullough and Siegel are ready to do battle as well on the western front, and as such, we will have to see how this game plays out. The Confederacy with their disastrous first set of moves that resulted in them losing two brigades is at the disadvantage here. The Confederates have no more reinforcements to come. Curtis and Siegel are poised to hit And despite the historical play so far in this battle, the Confederates are under threat, much as they were in real life. Be sure to check out the history of how Pea Ridge actually unfolded in our history review. Also, stay tuned for part two of our battle of Pea Ridge here on Tabletop History. We'll see you next time.